good morning. See, we are such a friendly church. I didn't tell them to do that, honestly. And good morning to everybody watching at home. So after two weeks of introduction, we are finally actually going to get into our series of teaching through 1 and 2 Corinthians. So just to recap for those who haven't been here, we've been looking at has God really said or did God really say through the lens of John 10.10, 10, which is that the thief came to kill and steal and destroy, but Jesus came to give us life and life abundantly or to the full. We're looking at 1 and 2 Corinthians because, thanks, uh, so you can all hear at home. Um, we're looking at 1 and 2 Corinthians because it was uh, an apostle chosen by Jesus himself. He came back from heaven and chose this guy on the road. We'll tell you a bit more about him over the next 30 weeks. But chosen by Jesus. And Paul was writing to a church who was full of new believers and full of converts. And there was even a smattering of mature believers amongst them. They were false teachers and false prophets. And they were good teachers and bad teachers. And there were people who were being destructive and people who were being naughty. And some great Christians too. And what we know is that in the Bible we have two books called 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. And they were both letters. They weren't books or poems. They weren't historical accounts like you would read a history book. They weren't science books, but they were letters. And what's weird is letters get sent in both directions, don't they? What we don't have is the other letters. So Paul wrote the people in Corinthians a letter, and they wrote back, but we don't know what they wrote because we haven't got it. I don't know why we haven't got it. Probably because when Paul wrote, thousands of copies would have been made to be sent over thousands of miles. But of course, the response would have been one copy to one man, Paul. And maybe he just wasn't very good at keeping a memory box with all his letters in. Or maybe it was such a horrible letter that he burnt it that evening. But what we do know is he responded to it. And have you ever listened to half of a phone call? You can always pretty much figure out what the other person was saying. Good morning. Good morning. They say, good morning. How are you? Well, I'm okay, thanks. I'm a bit tired. You can guess from what one side has said what the other side had said. That's just by way of introducing the introduction. Today, I wanted to do something quite special. Something that I found not hard, but quite moving to do. Because right at the beginning of this first letter, as is often the case with Hebrew letters, there was a, an introduction. We would write, hi Dave, I hope you and the family are well. Da, 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 da. God bless, yours sincerely, yours faithfully, Rick. That's how we write a letter. But they wrote it slightly differently. They had this waff uh, sorry, wordy, I was going to say waffly, but wordy introductions to letter from which we are today going to glean this one thing. And some really good friends this week gave me some advice about preaching. And they said, you make a really good point at the beginning. Can you remind us at the end? So I'm going to do that today. And that really good point that we're going to take away from today is love regardless. Did you get it? Love, regardless. Let me read you the passage. So we're going to just do 1 Corinthians 1, 1 to 9. But as we do this, I want you to count on your fingers and toes, and you might run out, nine short verses, and we're going to have a quiz. How many times do I say the word God? How many times do I say the word Jesus? And how many times do I say the word Lord? In nine short verses. Is it up there? 1 Corinthians 1 to 9. Oops, that will be my mistake because I wasn't looking at my notes when I told Alicia the Bible verses this morning. But I'm going to read it to you anyway, so the one that's missing, you'll be able to glean. Paul. This is the writer, not the recipient, because they write it differently to us. Called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus, our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, 
to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all of those in every place that call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given to you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift, as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. I read it. You read it. You've made a note in your Bible, I know. You had your highlighter pen out and your pencil trying to keep track of them all. How many times did Paul say God's name in that passage? Jake. Oh, did you? Okay, well, I'll tell you, if you get it right, that still counts. All together. Ooh. Close. Any, other, any advancements? All together. Can anyone go into detail? How many times was God mentioned? How many times Jesus? How many times Lord? Jesus eight. Six gods. Six gods? Heresy! There is only one God. Jeez. Should we do it again? Because I really... Who's got their notepads and their pens, their phones? Let's count them again. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes. To the church of God, that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, call to be saints together with all of those in every place, call upon the name of our Lord Jesus. I've not been counting the Lords, have I? I'm struggling to keep track of two things here. Both their Lord and ours. Look, I might be wrong. I got it as God five times, Jesus nine times, and Lord five times. So very close, but I've got a total of 19 Remember, you weren't following the last two verses either, so I had a slightly unfair advantage. I also knew I was going to do this. Sometimes, just sometimes, the Bible is really easy to read. What is the theme of these nine verses? God, Jesus, and the Lord. Okay, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three in one. The Holy Spirit isn't mentioned, but by definition he is there. Lord, we know that Lord with the capital L meant God, meant Jesus. Not little L. Little L could have been just like the boss or the landowner. But the point of these passages, whatever comes next, Paul is trying to tell you, Joe, to look to Jesus. To look to God. And you know, Paul has an advantage over us. When he sat down to write this letter, he knew what was coming next. We don't. Well, I do, because I've read it. I cheated. I read on. My question to us today, and it's rhetorical, so this is not part of the quiz, would we write the same introduction to that letter if we had known some of the following? That you had first received a critical letter. If somebody had written, or a group of people had written you a letter, really having a go at you, really telling you off, really questioning some of your life choices, some of the things that you thought were good, but they thought were bad. Would you have written the same introduction to another church or a group of people if you knew that they'd been changing the gospel? I don't know how passionately you feel about that, but to me, that's, that's worse than life and death. We talk about offence too much in this generation. 
But would you write to a church who was telling you that you could get to heaven without giving your life to Jesus? Would you still write, I give thanks to God for you every time I think about you? No, we don't want to jump straight into the nitty gritty, the telling off, the, but the Bible says this. Would we have written that little greeting to somebody who we knew? And Tim will remember this, and Brian. About one time, this happened to me, I got really upset with somebody. Really upset. Not angry, not violent, but really upset. I mean tearful. When somebody was lying to new believers. We had a whole load of people give their life to Jesus and somebody was telling them lies. Somebody was leading them astray. And by definition, elders are shepherds. We're there to care for our flock, especially our children and our young people. And I got genuinely moved to tears when I found out this person was lying to them and leading them astray. We managed to deal with that in love. But could I honestly have said in that moment that that is how I would have started that letter or that text or that WhatsApp or that email? I think Brian and Tim, Jonathan wasn't around then. It was a long time ago. But Brian and Tim will tell you, I didn't start our conversations like that, did I? I often came in a little bit red-faced, a little bit teary-eyed, a little bit stampy, if I'm honest with you, going, this isn't right. Stop making justification for this person. This has to change. So thank God he didn't ask me to write a letter. Would you write that letter to a group of your friends or fellow churches that you knew spent their whole time arguing with one another and falling out with each other? Or do you think that we may have written letters telling them off, trying to teach them, quoting Bible verse after Bible verse after Bible verse to justify why we were right and they were wrong? I have to confess that unless I was given time to think about it, I would probably get this wrong. In fact, there was Abraham Lincoln who was famously quoted for this. He said he would respond to angry letters almost every time. He would read the letter and he would write a response and he'd fold it and he'd stick it in an envelope and he'd seal it. And when he died, they went to his desk drawer and they removed all of the unsent letters. Beautiful when you think about it. But Paul went one further. He didn't just not send the angry letter. He sent a letter like this. A letter filled with love and thanksgiving and grace and mercy. Pointing straight at Jesus. I said I found this quite moving. As a church leader, as a man as a Bristol City supporter, as a husband, as a youth leader, as a golfer. I mean, I might just say this for those of you who know I golf. I accidentally joined a competition yesterday. I didn't know I had, and I accidentally came third. Like, there was a hundred people in that competition. Like, can I, can I, am I allowed to do that? Woo! Right. I am not a very good golfer, so I don't know how that happened. Like, the guy I was playing with, I've only met him once before, and he's like, I'm sure you're cheating. I don't know how you're cheating, but I'm sure you're cheating. And actually, golf is one of the most frustrating sports in the world. If you want to come and talk to me about, like, the deepest theological question of all time, try not to do that when I've just put a ball in the water on the 12th. Right? That's just not a good time to come and talk to me and find me at my most gracious. Golf is frustrating. But I did have a chance, and this is what God told me to do for today. He said, Ricky, would you start writing a letter to your church? I thought, why? I don't know what's coming next, because he didn't ask me to write the whole letter. Interestingly, when I told Matt and Tasha, I told Brian and Chrissy this during the week, just because we happened to be together. And when I finished it, they said, well, what would you put in the rest of the letter? So I did give that some thought after we, after we met. And I will share it with you. But if I were to write a letter to you, and I don't mean you just LWCC Basildon, because Paul wasn't writing to one building or one group of people. He was writing to a whole city of Christians. This is what I would write. 
I've obviously plagiarized some of the Bible to try and keep it in line with what he said. To the church of God that is in Basildon, and to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together, young and old alike, new and mature believers, and those who are still on their journey, with all those who are in every place, even in those other churches in Basildon, How about our friends and our partners in LifeLink and all the believers everywhere who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you. I'm sorry, this is poured, not out of the head, this is poured out of the heart. I give thanks to my God always for you, and I mean all the time, when I think about you. And that's not a head issue, that's a heart issue, it's how I feel. Your faithfulness to Jesus is an inspiration. Your faithfulness to each other, your friendship to me, and your support and your faithfulness to the Great Commission. For those of you who don't know, that means sharing the gospel with others, making disciples, in praying, in worshipping, in serving, and in giving. I give thanks to my God for you when I talk about you. And I talk about you a lot. And I have to say talk because the word I really want to use is brag. But bragging doesn't seem humble enough for a church leader. So I'm going to use the word talk, but you can hear the word brag if you want. Because when I talk about you to others, I can genuinely boast about all of the, the, the Lord is doing in your lives, both personally and collectively. I love it. I'm going to pause the letter. I loved it when I was in America. And they were like, hey, Rick, how's this thing going down in Basildon? And I smiled because every answer always started with, you ain't going to believe what God is doing there. Every week new people are coming. Sometimes because they moved to the area, sometimes because they haven't been to church for a decade, sometimes because they're coming to hear the gospel for the first time. We're seeing people saved, we're seeing people healed, we're seeing lives restored. Our youth ministry is now as big. Get this, it's not about numbers but it is about fruit. Our youth ministry on a Friday night has the same average attendance as we did when we first started four and a half years ago. Our youth ministry is 25 strong on a Friday. And they are proclaiming faith in Jesus and they are learning the Bible and they are praying and they are growing in faith and they're witnessing to each other. I give thanks to my God always when I pray for you. Do you know I pray for you? I have a list of your names. Sometimes they're spelt wrong and they don't have the first letter as a capital because I, I didn't know your surname when I first met you. So some of you are known quite literally by just first names or misspelled names or sometimes you know it's even like the child of because I've never learned their name because I've not met them yet, or the husband of because you didn't introduce yourself properly when we, or I didn't ask when we first met. I correct it over time, but I pray for you, and I pray for you based on home groups. I pick up a home group, and I pray through you. And do you know what happens? And this is going to give you a tip off now, is sometimes I pray over your name. Sometimes I know what's going on in your life, sometimes I don't. And if God makes me uncomfortable when I pray for you, I text you, or I ring you. Or I try and reach out to you in some way. Sometimes I'm right, sometimes I'm wrong. More often than not, something's happened that day or that week and it gives us an opportunity to talk. I can't say I always felt like this. It was hard when I first gave up my job and I moved from town to town. And I came to a group of people who were loving to each other and loving to me and loving to their community. But we were in a different place in a different time and it was unfamiliar to me. And I was miles away from my friends and my family. 
and miles away from my football team and life got hard. So it was hard to give thanks when life was hard. But today I can tell you, when I pray for you, I give thanks. Because, back to my letter, because of the grace, and by grace I mean undeserved, forgiveness, being washed clean, healed and restored. It's by that grace of God that was given to you in Christ Jesus that in every way you are enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you so that you were not lacking in any gift. As you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ. Love from, because I'm British, I'm not Greek or Hebrew, so I sign the letter off at the end rather than the beginning. Love from, Rick, called by the will of God to be an elder in this place, and from Tim, and from Jonathan, and Brian. To honour those questions of my friends in the week, If I'd written the rest of the letter, which I'm not going to do, what would I write? Well, first of all, you haven't sent me a letter, so there's nothing to respond to. So I thought I would just challenge myself. What are the problems we face as a church? I'm not talking about LWCC, remember. I'm talking about the city. What challenges does the church of Basildon face? I actually wrote in my notes, I'd hate to think what you might write to me in a letter. But seeing as you haven't. But if I had written any letter, the rest of the letter would look like this. Live in the world, but don't let the world live in you. Watch out for self-righteousness. Chrissy's going to talk a bit about that next week, so I don't want to dig too much into that. Don't make yourself higher than God. And if you want to know how, look for key pointers in your life. Time, priorities, morals, ethics, money, power, authority. And then to paraphrase some of Paul's others writing, if it is possible, this is Romans 12, 18, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. John wrote it differently in John 13, 35. He says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The rest of the letter is filled, filled with rebuke. He's telling them off. But Paul wrote to this group of people, this group of believers in love. He loved them regardless. He thanked God for them regardless because love should not be based on whether we agree on something or not. Love is based on Jesus. In marriage counselling, if you ever have to go through it, in marriage preparation, it's the same. It talks about never compromising. That's hard because the world tells us to compromise. It says, if, if I want to buy a blue car and Alicia wants to buy a red car... Well, actually, the world also tells me to go and buy a red car. It says compromise and go and buy the red car. And some of you ladies are smiling now, but it's not really the point. If I want to spend 100 bucks and she wants to spend 50, the world will say, well, why don't you spend 75? It's a compromise. Jesus says, keep your eyes fixed on me. And it's drawn like a little triangle, and I wish I'd put it on the screen. I just didn't have time this week, I'm sorry. But if you put me in the corner of a bottom end of a triangle, and you or somebody else in the other triangle. The world will tell us to try and find each other along the bottom of the triangle. Jesus says at the top of the triangle is me. And if you keep your eyes on him and I keep my eyes on him, inherently you'll grow closer together. The world is not about compromise. Actually, the world is now actually about compromise. Our world is not about compromise. Our world is keeping our eyes on Jesus and loving regardless. Ephesians 4, if you want to write down one passage, write this. Ephesians 4, 15. It says, instead, 
speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. You cannot be part of the body if you are separate from the body. You cannot be part of the body if you don't have Christ as your head. Instead, I want to read to you the whole of Ephesians 4, and we may stop, it's quite a long passage, but as we stop along the way, I will point out some key features. Ephesians is another letter written by Paul to a different group of people. But he expands upon what he's put in the greetings to the Corinthians. Because the Ephesian church was a slightly more mature church. Maybe I shouldn't have said mature, maybe I should have said better established. Perhaps it actually had a different set of problems. But it expanded upon the introduction. He says, they, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Today is no no different to any other day. In the last 2,000 years, today we might just be under a little bit more of the attack because of something special that's just about to happen. But the thief comes to kill and steal and destroy. He's going to want to do that to your marriage. He's going to want to do that between you and your children. He's going to want to do that in the church. And we let him. How depressing. We are one body, joined together, yet we allow the enemy to upset us, to upset the apple cart, to spill us over, to divide us. But we must be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit. Chrissy, again, I'm not going to, she's taking the kids out, is going to open this up to you next week. I really wanted to get into it today. I did. Where it goes to that point, it says, some of you say you're of Apollos and some of you say of Paul. And then it says this one, which I think our stream of churches is guilty of, just like they were 2,000 years ago. Where it says, and some of you say, I am of Christ. You self-righteous git. How dare you? And Paul was saying that to them. How dare you become so self-righteous that you have determined that your interpretation is the only way. Our stream of churches says it differently, don't we? We say we're a Bible-believing church. We're a Bible-believing church. Do you know, every church is a Bible-believing church. I'm not saying mistakes haven't been made. I'm not saying some churches have allowed tradition and culture to overtake. But we must not let that get in the way of our unity. It would be easy to preach this sermon to you, LWCC Basildon. There's only a hundred and something of us, and we all pretty much know each other now. And if you don't know each other, you can't fall out with each other anyway. But when I talk about our friendships with the Catholics and our friendships with the Methodists and our friendships with the URC and with the, and with the, and with the, and with the, how often do we fall out over theology and doctrine? I'm not saying we don't have to call out the false teachers and the false prophets, we do. Like I said earlier on, I got genuinely upset when I knew that a a person was dragging new Christians away from the gospel. But we mustn't allow it to destroy our unity. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean? Other than that he also descended into the lower regions, the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above the heavens, that he might fill all things. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, 
for building up the body of Christ. We've actually just been through a whole teaching series on that, so I'm not going to go into that. But if you don't know what that means, come and talk to us. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, by deceitfulness and schemes, rather speaking truth in love. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from who the whole body is joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up love when we were reviewing leadership in this church team leaders, home group leaders, youth group leaders children's leaders, our trusteeship our eldership, we just made Jonathan an elder and he's here today the family are in India, let's pray for them but Jonathan's here today do you know one of the things we look for is people that are not blown people that are not just blown around, they hear a great YouTube clip and they believe it They read a book and they believe it. A new phase or a new fad comes up and they believe it. And it fits and it works. And that's a bit more in line with the world. It makes me feel a bit less uncomfortable with my friends. And they're tossed from this side to that side. We mustn't be tossed around by the wind. We must be deeply rooted in the word of God. Deeply connected to the body of Christ. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. In the futility of their minds, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Due to their hardness of heart, they have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. You died. Every desire of the flesh every greediness. We often talk about sexual sin. I've changed it recently. I've started to talk about sensual sin. Because you might become self-righteous. Well, I've not slept with anyone. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Christian. I'm waiting until I get married. And that's great. But what about online porn? What about games? What about chocolate? Chocolate itself is not evil, but too much of it is damaging for you. What other sins and sensualities are we allowing into our lives and into our marriages? That desire for sensuality is basically becoming godlike. We're back in the garden looking at a forbidden fruit sex, polygamy, monog- monogamy, whatever it's called. I forget, I'll get all the words confused. Pornography. Greed, money, ambition, career. Add your sin in this space. Because I'm not here to judge you. But that person died. And you became a whole new creation. We should be fleeing, which we'll cover again in a few weeks. Fleeing from sin. Fleeing from idolatry. Even if that idol is ourself. Therefore, having died, therefore, having put away a falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Actually, let me highlight that as well. It says, do not sin in your anger. It doesn't say, don't be angry. Some false prophet, sometime, some false teacher, sometime, way back when, taught us all that it was wrong to be angry. If I don't get angry at least once a week, I think my heart has been disconnected from my head. It's been disconnected from my spirit and from my soul because I get angry. I can't go there. Yes, I can. I get angry when I hear of my friend's home being raided in Zimbabwe. 
being beaten within an inch of his life, having every possession stolen. And I'm not going to tell you what else happened because I can't deal with that yet. But I get angry and I get angry with God and I say, why? And the day I stop getting angry about injustice is the day I stop loving. But I didn't sin in my anger. I hope. I got angry. I get angry when I hear about slavery. It's 2022. I get angry when I hear people talking about slavery as if it somehow died in the 1800s when it is just as alive today. It just looks different. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labour doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamour and slander be put away from you. Along with all malice, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as Christ forgave you. Paul is a great teacher, chosen by Christ, full of wisdom, full of grace, full of mercy, but still man. So as I was reading this, that song that I asked Matt to play at the beginning, we're going to play again in a minute, as a response. It says, love one another wasn't enough for Jesus. Love is a massively overused word in our culture. No, no, no. No, Jesus didn't say love one another. He said love one another as I loved you. We talk about that sometimes when we talk about husbands and wives. That husbands are to love their wives like Christ loved the church. That means we die. We put away all selfish ambition. We don't have, we have this phrase in our house. And you'll be pleased it starts off with we don't. We don't do transactional love. We don't do, oh, thank you for my gift, let me give you a cuddle. We go, thank you for my gift. Can I have a cuddle too? We go, thank you so much for helping me today. Let me do this for you. No, no, let's do it together. And Alicia does something great. We have a song. Shall I sing it? It goes, Alicia's doing a good job. Alicia's doing a good job. Right? Because Alicia's doing a good job. But I don't then feel compelled like I have to do something in reply. We die to ourselves to love and honour each other. We get it wrong too. We're still newlyweds, so not too often. But, you know, we get it right and we get it wrong. But we have a heart's desire to serve and honour one another first. So I look at a problem and I say, man, there's lots of solutions. But which one of these solutions blesses me the most? No, blesses Alicia the most. And man, that's hard to train yourself thinking like that. Much easier when she's pretty and you love her and she's kind and you know she's going to give you a cuddle later. But old Terry here, he's nowhere near as pretty as Alicia. Damn sure ain't going to give me a cuddle later, that's for sure. Yeah, exactly, no cuddles later. But how about Terry and I are facing a problem? We're not, that's why I picked on him because he's a lovely man, I love Terry. But let's say we were facing a problem together. How inclined would my heart be to find the solution that best suited me? Or the one I felt was the right solution? Or the one that I thought was right for the church? And sometimes as an elder, we have to make that sacrifice too. But I'd love to think that when Terry and I have an argument, never happened, hopefully never will, but if we ever do, that we will will approach that in a way that says, how can I honour him the most? How can I love him the most? What will bless 
him the most. And sometimes that hurts. I should have said granddad because Jake's there, but that, that could have been anyone, couldn't it? There's lots of granddads here today. Jesus said, love one another as I loved you. So I have to die to any selfish ambition, any selfish gain that I might have in my heart. I praise God that he allows me to be a part of this church, allows me to be a part of what he's doing. I thank God for for that every day. Every time I think about what, what I used to do and what I could be doing versus what I am doing, and it's like you almost have to pinch yourself sometimes and go, wow, am I really that lucky? Am I really that blessed? Like, yeah, we could live in, in, in places that have bigger, older church buildings and big, lush green spaces and, and big shopping centres and, and bowling alleys and cheaper golf courses and, and all that kind of stuff. We could. We could be cl- closer to Top Golf. Why don't we have a Top Golf in Basel? We love Top Golf. Top Golf is fun, but it's miles away. But that's not the important thing in life. The important thing in life is I am so grateful to be a part of this church. Be warned. Don't let the world in. One of my favourite preachers says it like this. It says, the boat in the water is fine until the water gets in the boat. Think about that. You don't send an SOS signal when your cruise ship is in the sea. You send your SOS request when the sea is in your cruise ship. We are called to live in the world. But that would, if I had to choose one, that would be it. Don't allow the world into you. Don't allow the world into this church. Me and the other elders, will fight it as hard as we can at the door. We'll certainly protect the pulpit and the teaching and the home groups as best we can. But you must guard your hearts against false teachers and false prophets. Later on in the Bible, it calls it the spirit of the air. The spirit of that season, the spirit of that age, the spirit of, you might even say that generation. I could list what that spirit is today, it's obvious. Everywhere you go, it's the spirit of sensuality. That's what we're learning about today. Do this because it feels right. Don't do that because it doesn't feel right. In fact, let me even tell you how to feel. But it's a spirit of sensuality. Matt, I'm going to invite you to sing that song, which blessing. It's amazing. It's amazing to be blessed with such talented musicians in this church, isn't it? That we can say, here's a song, don't even know the title, Tim, but let's just sing that in worship, shall we? Yeah, whatever. And Trish is there. Trish, can you come too, please? Who else was in the band today? Sorry, when I say the worship leader, I mean the whole worship team. Um, Not to offend anybody or not call people by name, but just whoever was serving. But this is how Jesus loved his disciples. You know that Jesus died for you. You know that he came from heaven. You know that he rose again. You know that he left an empty tomb for you. But you know when he was still with us, this is how he loved his disciples. In John 13, 14, it says, Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done. Very truly, I tell you, No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Jake, are you interested in what I mean by washing each other's feet? Do you want to come and wash my feet? I'm just saying it's a bit hot today. My trainers are stinky from yesterday. These are dirty socks. But how much less if I told you I'd been walking around in my flip-flops all day? And then I told you I went to the farm with all the cows and the horses, and I walked through all their poo, and I said, here, Jake, come and wash my feet for me, mate. You wouldn't, would you? It doesn't matter. A friend of mine this week told me I should use more visuals on the screen, and I honestly considered this. I was going to get a big pile of manure on the screen. Really just so that when you leave this place today, You remember, no matter how much muck is on you, or how much muck is on each other, the people sat next to you, or the people you've fallen out with, Jesus washed their feet. The title of today's sermon, the point, the takeaway, was what? Can you remember? Love regardless. So Jake, you failed. It's okay, you're learning. You're my friend, you're my buddy. I love you, man.
regardless of the poop on your feet. Love one another regardless. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's sing it. Thank you.